Και τα αυτήν είναι. In this paper, I argue we can correctly speak of fascism in the free state if we understand the phenomena that brought to the fore Italian fascism as equivalent, but not identical to the crisis of liberal conservatism in Kumanagel, the emergence of the blue shirts, and the formation of Finnegal. To this effect, this is the structure of the paper. Per Wall will make explicit the constant main objections to consider the blue shirts and the crisis of Kumanagel as a fascist phenomenon. Part two will refute these objections by considering the trajectory of the Italian fascist party from its formation to its admission in power. Part three will deal with the categories using the free state to understand and regard Italian fascism as useful. And part four will show how the model of fascization, about which more later, but I can encapsulate it here as the radicalization of the moderates and the normalization of available extremists can explain the crisis of liberal conservatism in the free state. Part one. The usual objections to consider the crisis of Kumanagel and the formation of the blue shirts as instances of fascism in the free state can be summarized in three arguments. Ideological. Their fascism was incomplete, confused, poorly elaborated or restricted to few individuals. Autarchic. Local conditions perfectly explain and limit the emergence of the blue shirts, indicted alone and with no need of or justification for a foreign political experience. And three, teleological. The survival of free state democracy demonstrates how poorly revolutionary the blue shirts were and the non-existent impact on and legacy in the Irish political domain. Because fascists failed, it was not the real thing. It hardly existed. The ideological argument objects to designate the blue shirts and Kamana crisis as fascist on a self-deprecatory form of cognitive inability, fascist being fully, quote, far too intellectually demanding for traditional conservatives who flirted with paramilitaries, end of quote, capable, according to Hoppen, only of, quote, confusion and interested in the curiosities of contemporary papal corporatists as much as the wilder shores of fascist pure sun, end of quote. Garvin cordoned fascists to the, quote, extreme and fundamentalist wing of Irish separatism with its moral elitism, xenophobia and anti-Semitic themes, end of quote. The works of, by Reagan, Douglas and Professor McGarry Acknowledge how the blue shirts were as much expression of deep tendencies within Irish nationalists as part of a European wave. But even Professor McGarry's doubt about an alleged, quote, clear distinction between the support of blue shirts intellectuals for corporatist ideas associated with the Vatican and fascist ideology, end of quote, restates the definition of the blue shirts on ideological ground. The autarchic objection invokes Lyon's, quote, nemesis of a civil war against the death agonies of a Gaelic Weimar, end of quote, and Durbin's conflict over the annuities and the collapse of the living standards of substantial bourgeois farmers, cattle owners, and big landowners, Kumanagal grand electors, reducing the blue shirts to an auxiliary militia, or, as Manning put it, quote, an aberration in the closest brush Ireland has had with a class war. The teleological objections acknowledged in the words of Cronin how, quote, opposition to liberal democracy as a defunct system and impending economic collapse had set the preconditions for a fascist movement. But then, with Bew, Haselkorn, and Patterson, finds the willingness to, quote, break with parliamentary democracy and legality lacking the raw material for a successful fascist mass base, end of quote. Success is central for these objections, because the blue shirts acted in and left strictly stable conditions, not just political, but also social, specifically the absence of a proletarian Marxist revolutionary ferment, they could not have been seriously fascist. The survival of the free shirt democracy limits organized altogether 
fascism existence. But to continue seeing the blue shirt, the standard veteranization a wide army for liberal or conservatism in distress, economically terrorized land and cattle owners, the status anxiety of their children, a paranoia of nationalism, anti-communism, defense of Christian values, Western civilization, with a penchant for a martial outfits, hygienic ways to greet one another, and browsing a bridge translation of Gentilio Spirito, denies the blue shirts, their agency and independence from Kumana Gael, the Irish political domain seriousness and absolved the birth of Fine Gael completely from any style. All these objections look in the blue shirt for an imaginary fascist, fully formed, fully earned, pre-planned, a fascism of ideas alone, successful alone, a believer's fascism that excuse the ambiguity Italian fascism itself maintained in all its phases. These objections want the specific conditions and parameters of the Italian result, but reject the Italian lesson of how the fascist party had to accept and rely on degrees of support and understanding. These objections require the radical right. No, why not? Okay. required the radical right to define itself with more clarity than the original <coughs> Italian fascism and undertake everything immediately, openly. In part two, now I offer a better understanding of what we can correctly term as fascist to refuse those objections. Good. Griffin's definition of fascism, which still informs the new consensus, focuses on the fascist solipsistic agency, those who believed in that regeneration for nationalized masses seem to have acted alone. But fascism alone is fascism of no one. Mount's remark instead indicates to look for a useful political practice not a philosophical orthodoxy or a new doctrine. His perspective and this perspective is based on the militant works of Gramsci, Sturzo, Gobetti, Salvemini and Tasca that entitled the accommodation made within the framework of the state between the classes that expected their order, property, security and status defended by unmodernized liberal conservative representatives and the radical right available violence. Instead of the unstoppable rise of a hardline party endowed with a complete, conscious, omnipotent and separate ideology, they focus on the moderates collapsing towards and in the radical right, shedding light on an increasing process within the center right which would surge in fascism. This interpretation recognizes how historical fascism acquires significance only in relation to a conservatism that under pressure, revealed the extent to which its own normal rule and its values were premised on and identified with the preservation of bourgeois material interests. The pressure over liberal conservatives can be distinguished in three levels. Organizationally, they fail to evolve from notables to mass representative parties. Representationally, extended franchise with them and their constituencies, industrialists, landowners, army, monarchy, church, bureaucracy, at disadvantage with emerging left-wing mass parties and the veterans' shock squads on their right. And ideologically, the deference and traditional expertise, the government of the betters, had been annihilated by World War I nationalist mythology of a united fatherland. Conversely, the radical right organization opened to a mobilized mass membership under a militarized chain of command. Its representation appealed to those who rejected flattening egalitarianism of proletarian parties and the elitist impotence of liberal conservatives, the petty bourgeois of the losers of capitalists who wanted capitalism controlled 
not abolished. And the middle and upper class is membership of the Sheridan movement, who would trickle down the cost of that control to the workers and their parties, if the parties had to exist at all. Ideologically, the radicals' nation is mystical warfare comradeship, reclaimed and intensified ideals and values the center right had been attracted to nationalism, statism, and militarism, promoted it in war, but disappointing in its result. Those values magnify the threat from the left and the doubts about the democratic system itself. This is the pathology of normalcy, the divorce of societal conservatives, meaning the establishment, with norms built on property, security, and status from political conservatives, meaning their representatives, from the preservation of and belief in a democratic system no longer identical with and a guarantor of those norms, because that democratic system was permitting subversive left-wing mass mobilization. That pathology of those orders, common to the centre-right and the radical right, push the compatibility between those two, between liberal conservative representatives of the establishment and the rather ecumenical radical right wing to a convergence. As the end goal, the restoration of order was paramount and therefore the anti-democratic means necessary, attitudes toward violence, government powers, um, the value of democratic institutions, made no more a relevant difference between them. The center right resorted to the radicals' discipline violence as an instrument to call the subversive and strengthen their order, an option we may define the fascist toolkit for an extraordinary restoration and that order, their order, as more of the same. But taking more of the same order from the radical paramilitary mass violence, employing or even practicing it, I mean, that violence was no longer extreme, radical, but normalized, while the order and the political conservatives who aimed at it had become radicalized, reducing the alternatives to either with the radicals or under the subversives. On their part, the radicals realized conservative impotence had not become fully disorganized. It retained considerable strength, pushing them to a legal revolution with ideological deflection and often real concession. The radical needed the consent of and reward in the existing centers of power because their revolutionary ideology was ambiguous from the start. Mm -hmm. Yes. For those who needed it, fascists made converge the pre-war equilibrium, the authoritarian elements, laws and tendencies of the, pre of the previous system, with the ominous novi available to cooperate, widening the establishment legality with regimented, safely mass modernized legitimacy. This convergence between radicalized conservatives and normalized radicals is the process of, fascisti of fascistization, which permitted to maintain different practices, strategies, policies, and ideology within the right as degrees, negotiable quantities of mutual accommodation and availability. Realized fascists, the first Italian fascists, added fascists to conservatives. It was never a member-only dictatorship, much less one of believers. Fascistization, of which Italian fascism is tautologically the Italian result, it's not a single mandatory process, from civilian dictatorship to totalitarian party state, from autarky to expansionism, from racism to extermination. As a consequence, the proliferation of categories of surrogates such as parafascists, protofascists, clerical fascism, etc., for parties or regimes that look failed, incomplete, too reactionary, too moderate, too clerical, too conservative, to be called fascists is as pleonastic as objections about ideology, success, or local exceptionalism. Austrofascists, the French Croix de Feu, the Belgian Brexit, the blue shirts, have to be assessed on their own ground, not in Italy, 
Which brings us to part three, how Italian fascists was perceived in the free states. The questions the Irish civil war imposed on the pro-treaty side prepared the acceptance and adaptation of the utility of Italian fascism. The pro-treaty citizen auxiliary militia Collins had accepted on 29 July 1922 was still in the democratic realm. Quote, peace will have to be maintained by the active cooperation of the people themselves, end of quote. But the ambiguity of terms like peace, active cooperation, the people, opened the breach for a creative usage of Italian fascism. Hugh Kennedy, the executive chief law advisor, and Kevin O'Shea, his deputy, recommended the German Freikorps to eradicate left-wing rebellion, while Postmaster General J.J. Walsh favored the creation of an Irish fascist. The fundamental premise for these usages had been expressed by the Irish Times as a fascism is a, quote, dramatic revolutionary coup that had stamped out the seemingly unavertible Bolshevist and anarchy, end of quote. Compatible with this conservative version of fascism, a radical one was prominently expressed by George Russell's Irish statesman, who advocated a frankly totalitarian evolution of mutual society. Fascist was, quote, an efficient organization of the Italian democracy and political institutions using force against chaos. Democracy was not going to be free. Its tendency now is rather to be efficient, as the state everywhere becomes more and more modern, modern interferes more and more, regulates more and more, and it does not matter sixpence whether theoretically it is democratically controlled. The machine will more and more dominate its national quite as much as the dictatorships. End of quote. Conceived as dramatic auxiliary to defend the state in the existing social order, and at the same time a spontaneous but inevitable force to transform that order, these Irish fascists, as Irish Time told its public, could be adopted as nothing more than clear sightedness and common sense. Fascismo itself is nothing more than a fancy name for these most valuable attributes. These reformist and conservative versions of Italian fascists demonstrate how it had really become a resource of inspirations how they could borrow and adapt, cross-fertilized with particular ambition and national traditions, a model and a space for the interwar European right. And from that space, I begin the fourth and final part, for it was there that took place the authoritarian trajectory and the formation of the blue shirts as a response to Kamanagel free crisis, the organization of the party, how the government represented the electorate, and what ideology both projected on the state institutions. First crisis, rudimentary organization, Kumanagel remained reluctant to involve the masses. The anti-treaty side had taken over with arguments of purity, fidelity to the cause, and martyrdom for the next generation. The remedy was governance and reduced the party to a, a high-class political social club, the nucleus of a party institution which would represent the best elements of the community. Second crisis, incoherent representation. Relying on notables patronage was less a choice and more the inevitable consequence of how Command Nagel had emerged from the Civil War emergency government as the wide coalition that least divided yesteryear home rule elites, unionist remnants, business people, professionals, landed classes, the Catholic hierarchy, and the bourgeois of rate payers, small farmers, and provincial traders. This paternalist amateur organization of urban professionals and rural worthy could equate democracy with their political dominance thanks to the parliamentary isolation their republican enemies had chosen. But from that isolation inevitably emerged differences that fractured the representation of the electors' interests. Let's say on our right, conservative factions clustered around O'Higgins coagulated a political, social, and moral order in a hierarchy of class and education. For them, the civil war had demonstrated a pessimistic anthropology, organized crime and sabotage on the grand scale, anarchy with arms, criminality latent in men everywhere, 
for which the state must defend itself against all factors which make for its destruction. Let's say on our left, there were pro-treaty Republicans in the National Army that have fought in the Civil War, and their allegiance to civilian control, conditional to nationalist and, let's say, progressive aspirations. In November 1922, this faction had as Carlos Gravy, if he did, quote, mean to get the Republic, to quote, and in the mutiny, two years later, they expected Kermanagel to stand for, quote, the common people of Ireland, and what the common people want under the free state is to abolish the ascendancy, to undo the conquest, and resume the course of their national life as masters in their own land, end of quote. As the pragmatic but unstable balance of these forces, Kermanagel achieved the unprecedented in Irish history. A Catholic majority with legal powers <coughs> excuse me, to rule a partition base, homogeneous territory, no more London centre, minimal industrial interest in the proletariat, much reduced denominational cleavage. But in continuity with history, the welfare of this homogeneous country was assumed as dependent on that of the establishment the main constituency of the government, representing a respectable conservatism gentry that will look after deferential tenant citizens. Hans Kumanagel reverted to the traditional free trade of cattle, abandoning Griffith's proje protectionist project. And yet the paradox of Kumanagel's decade of government was how its biggest success, the constitutionalization of the opposition, eroded the basis of its power. In 1927, Fianna Fáil entered the Doyle, took the oath as a, an empty formula, enjoyed its constitutional opposition to the treaty, the abolition of the oath, the Senate, and Governor General, with bread and butter promises for the less British integrating constituency Command Nagel had neglected. Middle classes looking for a greater share of a protected market, Catholic sector who, who wanted a greater say in the laws enthusiasts of Gaelic language and those who had become frankly lukewarm on the treaty. Fianna Fáil began to occupy the political centre and reshape republicanism, making it mainstream conservative. Which brings it, us to the third crisis, ideological paralysis. In the 1927 election manifesto, Commander Girl promoted the successful administration of the state and its nationalist achievements, admissions at Geneva, establishment of a radio broadcast, diplomatic representatives, repeating the message and the belief of having achieved, quote, the essence of a republic, establishing the constitution, end of quote, the subtext being the revolution is over. But raising the treaty to the accomplishment of Irish history, Kermanagel had turned it into the symbol of a comprehensive order, the neck plus ultra of legitimacy. The pragmatism that had conjured into existence the treaty order stopped Kumanagal from moving beyond its economic, social, and ideological limits and the interest of its constituency. With Fina Foil, the treaty domain had taken it that mass politicization Kumanagal had been refractory and unprepared to. Fewer enemies of the state would no longer eat, to Kumanagal, a rentier reward for traditional competence and having protected the state. Kumanagail had nothing like Fianna Fáil machine. Its representation still unchanged in the wider political contest and its ideology of entitled service to the country prone to the anger and fear of its electorate. That Kumanagail began to consider in public an authoritarian solution just two years after the constitutional space had opened the possibility of going into opposition demonstrates how its leadership, like many interwar center-right parties, conceived any alternative to their order as threats of anarchy, now coming from within the institutions. The treaty, the source of legitimacy, had to be defended against its own legal expansion. The shift of how to defend order followed the European trajectory of liberal conservatives trying a legal suspension of the constitutional order. The dilemma Minister of Finance Blight evaluated was stark. Fina Floyd might be, quote, changing the constitution against the will of the people, 
or thanks to the franchise in the hands of an ignorant and foolish populace, menace to any country. The preventive solution was that the army would be bound to subdue a political people for the welfare of the people in general, as they possess the instruments best fitted for it. End of quote. The logic of democracy under tutelage, the tension between entrusting freedom to the people and saving it from the electorate, restricted the alternatives before the 1932 elections to either the staunchest defense of the status quo, cuts of wages and pensions for teachers, police, civil servants, and higher taxation, never a good idea, before the elections, or attack on widespread subversion, berating a people entirely lacking a highly developed civic sense and moral courage and accepting that penalty by military tribunals, internment, and censorship by decree. This dichotomy, either the free state or subversion, should be put in a continuum with the civilian alternatives Minister for External Affairs McGilligan envisioned. Quote, either to deal with the situation by decree, not ratified by the Doyle, going to the electorate on the satisfactory use we had made of very strong powers, or we should state the case for endowing some governments with such powers and go to the country for our mandate. The remedies Commander Gell considered for its crisis, an extraordinary legislation, emergency cabinet, temporary dictatorship, had a self-contradictory premise. 20th century doubt about masses unreliable, ignorant, manipulated, or complicit with the enemies of the state, and the 20 and the 19th century Bonapartist remedy. The army intervene, the executive retain control, and the quiet peasantry give thanks, are incoherent. Emergency is no cure for people inherently anarchic, which can be trust with democracy. Commander Gael did lose only 3,000 votes nationally, but we hopefully let Fianna Fáil sink in government having, after having publicly preached the Red Apocalypse made many top rank members and the electorate dissatisfied with the leadership itself, desperate for their safety and despondent with a system that let in the enemies of the free state legally. The first sign of radicalization of conservatives came from within the security sectors. Fears for property, meaning pensions and jobs, for security, from fear retaliation by the regulars government, and for status, the honor the state and the public recognized for their service. Rumors of a coup had gathered around army and police, prominent among them the police commissioner, and reached the government. Cosgrave, the leader of Commander Gael, denied as, quote, grotesquely untrue, end of quote, the cabinet had been involved, but Blythe, the Minister of Finance, had certainly been privy to those rumors. Fianna Fáil travel attacks on property, the economic war, security, IRA prisoners released, Kumanaga rallies left unprotected, and a tighter control on the special branch, and status of bills to abolish the Senate, the Governor General, and the oath that is on the identity between legality and legitimacy, and the impotent opposition of political conservatives of Kumar Nagael called for an independent action of self-defense by the most prepared line of social conservatives, a veteran association, the army Gosh. comrades association. Kumar Nagael could regard the 5 10,000 strong association as an auxiliary organization of muscular and a uniform stewards. But accepting and outsourcing mass security posed a risk to Kumar Nagael. With a strong organization and the ejection of Collins' militancy to O'Higgins' establishment constituencies and an ideology of order at any cost, Blythe recognized the association was dangerously near to, quote, running its own candidates either separately or in conjunction with other groups. And to quote, competing as a party with a parliamentary opposition. Crowning was correct to individuate in quote, the state of uncertainty within that group, Commander Gael, 
and the lack of firm direction the reason why a number of rogue thinkers and political egomaniacs could come to dominate the main opposition. End of quote. Such diagnosis, however, assumes political sanity hadn't changed and was still the aim of the electorate and of the silent majority of politicians. It tells nothing why in 1932, five duels, army comrade and command Gael members stood as candidates or the 150 who escorted Cosgrave to a podium at the rally in September. A preliminary answer says the blue shirts repeated the ambiguity Italian fascists had exploited exciting order and respectable defiance, offering everything Kumana Gael weak parliamentary opposition wasn't given. O'Higgins, the director of the Army Corrades Association and a Kumana Gael member of the Doyle, implied it after the 1933 snap elections. The movement had to step up its organization and recruiting in every parish in Ireland to satisfy the zeal for patriotic activity of the best of the young manhood, defend the right to work with those who serve their country and their people, law and order, the safety of life and the safety of property, Christians' ideals of citizenship, democratic freedom in the best sense, sanity and responsibility in politics, national reunion by peaceful means, every legitimate means must be used to expose the menace of communism, end of quote. Nothing dramatically different from and clearer than their continental colleagues, nor anything a conservative command girl voter would object to. Two reasons to make the association an asset and the risk for command girl. As Blight himself recognized in the Berger he recommended, Blight feared competition from McDermott's center party, a neo Redmondite Farmers Federation with a tentative post-treaty issue-based platform. In February 1983, still disorganized with lower finances and a competitor in the center, Kumana Gael had to campaign as the caution's reasonable, paler shade of Finafoil. After eight months of Finafoil dismantling the treaty, many electors trust the state would survive and leave in Finafoil or if they opposed Finafoil, they voted for the Centre Party, and so Comana Gael lost elections and votes. Ideologically, the complaint, quote, the politicians have been beaten, have beaten the statesmen, end of quote, reveals the extent of Comana Gael post-democratic despair. Organizationally, subscribers reminded Cosgrave the party was in disarray. And Kumana Gael belated recognition of having to enlarge its representation with the decision to lower membership fees limped behind the radicalization of its constituency the Cork examiner had made explicit, quote, it is the IRA that rules the country and for this the ordinary electors who voted for Fina Foil are to blame, end of quote. Branded the majority complicit with crime Fina Foil and worthy of democratic rule meant the legal and legitimate order had been cut. The main feature of that post-democratic space was renewed politicized violence with over 300 incidents from the beginning of 1933. Targeting cattle auctions, Fina Foil and IRA supporters, the blue shirts violence exerted by the excited sons of malcontent middle-aged farmers once the staunch supporters of the party of order joined anti-social feelings and the defense of the existing social order, where democracy became the authoritarian rule the establishment legalizes and the revolution legitimizes. By midsummer 1933, the blue shirts had a new leader external to Comanagel, the recently fired Duffy, the police commissioner, an organization ranging around 10, 15,000 members, larger than the defense any party required, and an ideology of radical regeneration, in Kuwait, but certainly closer to that Gaelic romantic sentimental nationalist Kumanagel had been called to during its administrative tenure. Now, half digest the full choreographies the fascist salute, language references, Yeats' bizarre and unsingable anthems might have been, 
but they express hostility toward Finophone, naturally, and dissatisfaction with Kumar Nagael. Obviously, such radicalization did not need to invest the entirety of either party or the militia. The ideologically committed members of the Blue Shirts, often also members of the party, were more active and extreme than the members of the Doyle and voters. But it is these different degrees that permitted the actual convergence of radical and moderate. In this perspective, the parade to the cenotaph, discontinued by Fina Foyle, could both commemorate the treaty order founding martyrs, Griffith, Collins, and Kevin O'Higgins, and show revolutionary defiance against an oppressive government, closing the fascist circle of the revolution for an older order. Indeed, the former commissioner recurred to the established national strategy of reducing and polarizing the political options. The convergence between radicals and moderates can be asserted in what really did not happen in the parade. The large consensus on the absence of real intentions and means to coup stresses irrelevant differences with the march on Rome. To topple the Finafol government, the parade needed neither an inexistence conspiracy with the army nor poor coordination between insufficiently armed squads. Only the likely riots between security sectors, blue shirts, IRA, and Finafol supporters, which, as De Valera himself said, quote, would lead here to conditions bordering on anarchy, end of quote. Kumanagaya leadership, the political conservatives, took the ultimate leap failing to give even a parliamentary cover to the parade they had been staging till 1931, and meekly wishing, in the, word of Co in the words of Cosgrave, the blue shirts to, quote, growing in all parts of the country, they are perfectly entitled to have their parade, legally and morally. I, Cosgrave, don't recognize anybody's right to stop the parade. It is an organization that is going ahead very fast, end of quote. Thanks to the thousands with dual membership, Kumanagel radicalism had already migrated in the blue shirts, in the militia, in the radicals. For Blythe, O'Higgins, Dylan, Mulcahy, it didn't matter under which guise convergence had taken place. Odafi and the militia had escalated the challenge to the government with a disciplined image. The parade was the radicalization moment. Confronted by a firm leader, sufficiently loyal security forces and the majority of the public reasonably satisfied with the government, the blue shirts withdrawal showed their moderation, which was the normal moment or the normalized moment. It also made inevitable the completion of the fascist convergence, the alliance of two enterprises losing in their respective field, opposition in the Doyle and anarchy on the streets. In 1933, the party whose raison d'etre was to govern and provide order needed a defense organization, a stronger representation to compete with other treaty-based parties, and a bright new idea, compatible with the material interest of its grand electors, promising stronger nationalist actions, but ambiguously, that is, bellicose in rhetoric, but not actively anti-British. The Blue Shirt radicals ticked all boxes. In that summer, political and social elites went beyond the boundaries of constitutional democracy, meeting, merging with, and joining a militia which, like all fascist parties, had realized it could seize power neither military nor alone. What unified the parties, the militia, and their constituency was the common enemy, Fina Foyle, which acted as the left-wing mass mobilization in Irish categories. What kept them par in parallel compatibility was the ambiguity of the order to restore the re-establishment of the treaty, the state, and the statues it symbolized, and the accomplishment of a final revolution with a new legitimacy. As I've tried to show, fascistization clarifies what Kanki correctly looked for and compared. Let's begin with ideology. It releases us from overstressing the impact of the, quote, the absence of a coherent ideological identity at the center of the crisis of treaty politics between 1922 and 1933. 
which <clears throat> Reagan noted. It can detect even in the most lenient view of the blue shirt, a collateral organization defending freedom and helping respectable dating, the frustration with political conservatives unable to defend established legality and the material basis of its legitimacy and its own militant forms of social and political restabilization. Like many other conservatives who just tried fascists to defend freedom, Kumanagel radicalized and moved away from its centrist, traditional, liberal conservative space as a party and the institutions they had built. In terms of ideology of success, fascistization asked the right question about blue shirts failure. Failure at what? They were Fine Gael first and only mass organization, what Kumana Gael had desperately needed. At the top of the blue fury, the 1934 local elections show no increase or decrease of votes from Kumana Gael average votes. In the process of fascistization, the relations between Kumana Gael and the formation of the blue shirts drew one authoritarian trajectory where increasingly radicalized liberal conservatives and mobilized, normalized paramilitary radicals overlap and the relevance and even the meaning of their differences diminish in the coordinates of the 30s when the thing actually happened. In terms of local conditions, the coordinates of anti-communist, anti-array, for Christian civilization, for a more muscular nationalist but compatible with Britain and trading with it, for a more efficient over democracy but without wealth redistribution beyond the treaty but keeping its order, do not and could not find Italian fascists in the free state because they had to find fascists for the free state. And I hoped I demonstrated the existence of a native fascist process which purported to preserve and surpass the social hierarchy and reignite an acceptable version of populist nationalism for radicals and conservatives alike. The Kamala Gael and the blue shirts saw in the dark mirror of fascism answers about democracy and able to defend their freedom and interest from politicized masses reveals quite a lot about the conservative and militant, radical and respectable order they wanted in the free state. In 1922, Italian fascism was still new, but Yates had already recognized the ambiguities that order and courage. Quote, I've met some of the ministers who more and more seem too sober to meet the wildness of these enemies, and everywhere one notices a drift toward conservatives, perhaps toward autocracy. End of quote. And that drift, the crisis of the Irish liberal conservatives, began. Thank you.